sing it out. Beneath my shame, and who can carry that kind of weight? It was my too until I. Stuart Heights, we're so glad that you have decided to worship with us today. And we, we encourage you guys to sing along. And um, these songs that we have been given in this time that we live, um, most of them come straight out of Scripture. And I'd like to point them out to you. Um, the last song, um, I am completely went blank. This next song is 1 John 4, 18. It says, where there is love, there is no fear. And so whatever is in your life today that you are afraid of, that you are fearful of, this morning there is hope in Jesus Christ. We learned this song last week. We're, I'm gonna, we're gonna sing the chorus right now, just a little bit of it. And it says that my fear doesn't stand a chance in your love. So it goes like this, we're gonna sing the chorus. Cause my fear 
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Let's sing it one more time. I think you guys are getting it. Let's try it again. My fear. first verse when darkness tries to roll over my bones let's sing it together when darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken no I here it comes, I'll sing it. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
about that name. Let's sing it. Jesus. Like the free 
to sing that song one more time. It may have been a while since you've called out to the name of Jesus, or maybe you're here today exploring and you've never called out to his name. But look, can we sing it one more time? Just the congregation voices. Let's all sing together. with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifices that he made for us. The sacrifices he made for the whole world. As desolate and as evil as this world can be sometimes, he died for all of us. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the name of Jesus. Father, as we are experiencing now with springtime on its way, and how when the sun in our solar system starts to peak out, how we feel better, we feel more active, we feel energized, just like the sun in our solar system, when we call upon the name of Jesus, your son, how much more so we are energized, how much more we are encouraged by the name of Jesus. So Father, we thank you this morning that because of the sacrifices he made that we can call upon his name. And as we just sang, one day kings and kingdoms will all pass away. There's been mighty kings and kingdoms in the past. There are mighty kings and kingdoms now. But at the end of the day, they all pale in comparison to you and your kingdom. So, Father, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that that will resonate in our heart in such a way that we will be intentional about talking to our friends and our coworkers about this kingdom and about the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us this morning. Pray that your will be done here. Pray that you'll be glorified. We ask these things in your son's holy and precious name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's take a few moments, shake hands with those around you and welcome them this morning.
Well, all right, let me invite you to take your Bible and your bulletin. If you've got a bulletin on the way in, I encourage you to take that out and look at the outline that's provided for you there because we need to do a little bit of adjustment to that. Uh, not a great deal. If you have the right date, you should have the right outline in front of you that will sort of give you some uh, a, a guideline about the way that we're going to work through this passage this morning. But I want to put a, another blank at the top of the outline uh, that, that not wasn't omitted, but we need to begin with this understanding. And so put a, a couple blanks at the top, and, and you need to put this uh, at the top of the outline, this truth. Life is hard. I know some of you might be thinking, uh, well, that's great insight, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thanks for putting that in a blank for us. You put the blank under whichever part of that you want. If you want to put life, blank is hard. But life is hard. But God is good. Life is hard, but Jesus is faithful. Life is hard because the world is broken. And life is hard, but Jesus is coming. We live in a broken world that is wrecked and scarred by the fall. If you go back and look in the beginning of the book, God created everything and declared it good. And it was going on wonderfully and and, and God made man in his own image and made us with the capacity to know him and have relationship with him. And he put man and woman in the garden and they were enjoying perfect fellowship with one another and with God until the fall, until sin entered the world and the adversary came and, and lied to the man and the woman and said, you shall surely not die if you eat that fruit. God's holding something out on you. If you eat that, then you'll be like him, and, and God doesn't want that. And so they ate of the fruit, and sin entered the world, and from that moment, the relationship that existed between God and man was fractured, and God began this process of, of rescuing mankind. And the whole first part of the book that we call the Old Testament is God calling out a people unto himself and making a covenant people with the people Israel with the promise that one day through that people a Messiah would come and that Messiah is Jesus. And that he would come and, and pay the, the penalty for the sin of the world as Patrick prayed just a moment ago of thanking God for sending Jesus to pay the sin, the, the sin penalty for us. And that if we would call out to him, that he would rescue us and, and save us. And we live in the eager expectation of his return because the book promises that he will return. But in the meantime, we still live in a world where the adversary is active. We live in a world that has set its heart and its face against the one who created it and called it good. And because of that, life is hard, but God is good. And because of that, life is hard, but Jesus is faithful. And because of that, life is hard, but we live in the eager expectation and confident assurance that Jesus is coming again. But in the meantime, what do we do? In, in the meantime, how do we live in this, this conflict, in this tension of, of following Jesus, of being Christ followers, and, and moving toward him, and, and moving and growing in Christ's likeness, but living in a world that is diametrically set against him? Well, Jesus talks about that. In John chapter 15, where we are this morning, I want to invite you to take your Bible. And then the latter half of John chapter 15, Jesus is spending these last few hours with his disciples before he will go to the cross. And he does some astounding and extraordinary things in these last few hours. And 
This is the series where we find ourselves uh, during this time leading up to Easter. As we examine these passages that John records for us, and God has been so gracious to us to, to, to inspire John to write and to preserve these texts for us so that we can have insight into these precious few hours that Jesus has with his disciples. And he gives them encouragement, he gives them instruction, and he gives them uh, action to follow. And he also gives them some words of warning about what is to come. And that's really one of these text this morning, but in this word of warning, he still brings encouragement. So look with me in John chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 17, and we'll work all the way through the end of the chapter. In John 15, he writes this, John writes this, this I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Well, that's encouraging. And Jesus is introducing the idea to the disciples that he's about to leave them. But he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. It's to your benefit that I go away because if I don't go away, then the helper won't come. And oh, by the way, the world in which you live is going to hate you. And it's not is going to like later on it will hate you. But the words that Jesus uses right there is like right now it is actively hating you. The way the grammar is when it says that the world hates you, it, it's talking about something that is occurring while the speaker is speaking. So it's saying because it hated me and you're following me, it already hates you. So if we stopped there, would you feel wonderfully encouraged? Or just informed of the reality that exists because the context hasn't changed. Chronology of, of passing of time from Jesus' time physically on earth until now, this context hasn't shifted. But if you are of the world, verse 19, if you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. I don't want you to, to miss the, the strong accusation Jesus is making there. I came and not only proclaimed who I am, but proclaimed it through powerful deeds and actions. Because if you go back and look at the miracles through the Gospels that Jesus did, Jesus never did miracles for the sake of his sideshow or to simply impress the people around, but it was always connected with a proclamation of who he is. Demonstrations of power and authority. And if you go back and read through the, through the book of Mark, you see all of these expressions of authority that Jesus did this and Jesus did this and Jesus did this. And it was all in this proclamation of who he is and why he came. And Jesus is saying, they not only heard the proclamation, but they saw the deeds that I did and still hated me. And because they hate me, they hate their father. And Jesus is making this strong proclamation about the world. And in verse 25, he says, but they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled that it is written in their law. They hated me without cause. Still prophecy being fulfilled about the Messiah. And when the helper comes, verse 26, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. And you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. Well, I want to walk through this outline for us this morning. And in the first two points of the outline, give some understanding of the context in which we live. 
And then the last point is, is some encouragement about what we do in this context. How we live as followers of Jesus in the middle of a context that, that hates us because of the one to whom we claim loyalty and allegiance. Because of the one who we submit to as Lord, because of the one to whom we have given our lives. How do we live in that context? Well, in this text, Jesus shows us the contempt of the world. This command I, I give you in verse 17, that you love one another. You be busy about loving Command is given, love one another. Jesus also told us to love our enemies. So the question comes, to whom are we supposed to show love? Who are we supposed to love? Well, the answer is one another and our enemies. Well, everybody, love your neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? The people that you engage this week, love them. If you need a blank, there it is. The people that you engage this week, love them. Well, how do I do that? 1 Corinthians 13 tells us what love looks like. And in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, you shouldn't be surprised because you've been following me for these around three years now, and you've seen how the world has set itself against me. It shouldn't surprise you then if you follow me that the world also sets itself against you and hates you. That word is well translated. If you're thinking, well, hate seems kind of strong. It is strong. It's a strong and accurate word. The word means detests. Don't be surprised when the world detests us. Well, there are a couple of ideas that we need to look at there. Who's the world? What, that word, what does that word world mean? It's the, the world, it's the word cosmos. The way that can be defined is that which pertains to space but not to time, but it means the sum total of the material universe and the beauty in it and the sum total of the person's living. So there's your encouragement for the morning. Expect to be hated by most people. Grammatically, Jesus isn't saying something that will begin in the future, but something that the disciples can prepare for later on. But no, the world is actively hating them as Jesus is speaking that. And in this contempt of the world, the world actively expressed its anger towards Jesus. Because in the way that the Gospels are, are written, we see some things about Jesus that, that are clearly identified that the world pushed back against. And the first part is the purpose of Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus expresses that his purpose is to come and give his life for a ransom for many. And so the reason I came is to, to, to die. The reason I came is to give my life for a ransom for many. And so Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom. Jesus comes with the intent to die for the sins of man. He comes calling people to repent. And all throughout the Gospels, you see this, this growing disdain and detesting of the people against Jesus. In John chapter 5 and verse 18 the, John, uh, the Gospel writer says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So all the way back in the beginning of John, they're actively beginning to plan to kill him. John chapter 7, after these things, Jesus was uh, walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. John eleven fifty three. 53, from that day on, they planned together to kill him. This plan, they expressed their anger in their planning. It didn't just come to them at the end of the book, but rather through the majority of Jesus' ministry on earth, there were people who were actively seeking his life. And there were times where, where Jesus escapes through the crowd because his time had not yet come, because he hadn't yet fulfilled everything that was promised about the Messiah. So in his purpose, there is active work against him. And not only in his work, but also in his passion. Jesus' purpose was lived out in his passion, which was to demonstrate that the love that the Father has for the fallen creation. In John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. He's giving them a reminder and an encouragement, but also a little bit of a, 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 a fore understanding of what he's about to do. He's going to give, this them, give them this instruction, then live that out for them. 
Uh, not only in his purpose and his passion, but also in the person of Jesus. Jesus demands absolute loyalty. He leaves, it allows no room for wiggle room. Jesus did not allow space to keep a foot in both worlds when he was physically on the earth. Because people who, who say, well, that Jesus was only a good teacher, but he never really claimed to be divine, he never really claimed to be God, when people say that, they're admitting that they really have not read the Gospels with understanding because Jesus regularly and repetitively proclaimed himself to be equal with God. We just looked at one of those things where the Jews were wanting to kill him because he called God his father and therefore put himself equal to God. Mark chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10, they both relay to us the narrative where someone approaches Jesus and calls him good teacher. And Jesus stops him and says, why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. And so if you're referring to me as good, then you are referring to me, equating me to God. Then if you're calling me good, then you are recognizing that I've proclaimed to you that I am divine and that you're affirming that. They're not ascribing to him a character trait of, oh, he's a good guy. That's not what he's saying. Good teacher. And he stops him and says, there's only one who is good. His claim of divinity is repetitive throughout the Gospels and demands that the people who follow him affirm him as that. They don't follow him because he's a good teacher, and especially they don't follow him because he did things, because when Jesus fed a lot of people bread and they began to follow him, he turned around and, and said, oh, by the way, if you're going to follow me, all it's going to cost you is everything that you have. And a large part of the crowd said, that's really more than we want to pay. We were just looking for lunch. And they walk away, and Jesus turns around to the disciples and said, are you going to leave me too? And the disciples look at him and say, well, where else would we go? Who else has the words of life? We're not following you just for the bread. We're following you because of who you are. And then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am all these things. And whenever he says, I am, those are all these references, the, these, these very strategic and intentional references. All through the book of John, Jesus says, I am this thing. I am this thing. And that is the reference to the great I am. Tell them, I am has sent you from the Old Testament. So his claim of divinity demands absolute affirmation of who he is. We can't just affirm him as a good teacher or as a miracle worker, but only as Messiah and God. And therefore the world hates him. But we also see it in their attitude. Jesus talks about it in verse 9, or verse, excuse me, verse 19 of chapter 15. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. <laughs> if you were of them, they'd love you. If you were of the world, they would be loving you because the world loves their own. In their attitude, they love their own because the world fits into its own mold. Not only fits into their own mold, but there is an agreement among them. What he's saying there, if you were of the world, if you, if you thought like them and, and talked like them and acted like them and affirmed the same things that they affirm and all these, the, these things that bring them together, they would love you. But in this, you see Jesus is drawing a line in the sand of, of you can't be with them and, and with me. There, there is this call of, of absolute loyalty to Christ that because of that will put us at odds with the direction of the world, and therefore the world will hate us as it hated and still hates him. Verse 19, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The attitude of the world is that they love their own, but they hate God's own because we've been transformed. He called us out. And put us on another direction. Not only have we been transformed, but we have been transferred into, into him and we belong to him. And so he sets this context that as followers of Jesus, that the world will, will be working against us. And this is some place that, that followers of Jesus often 
find very difficult to engage rightly because when, when someone hates us, there's something in us that, that if we can just be honest for a moment, kind of want to hate, kind of wants to hate them back. Well, well, if they hate me, well, well, they hated me first, so I can hate them back. That seems fair. You know, that, that seems reasonable, except for the fact that Jesus calls us to love those who persecute us. Except for the fact that Jesus calls us not only to, to love people that love us, he said anybody can do that, but love those who persecute you. Love those who hate you. Jesus not only calls us to that, but, but models it for us. In the way that he engaged with the people that actively and antagonistically hated him. Even to the point where when Jesus was on the cross and he cries out, Father, forgive them for they, they're just meanies. Is that what he says? No. Father, forgive them for they, they know not what they do. Life is hard. Following Jesus can be difficult. Following the world is easy and simple and can make you popular and make you well-liked. Following Jesus might not do any of those things. Life is hard, but God is good. And life is hard, and Jesus is faithful. And life is difficult if we're following him because it will naturally put us at odds with the world in the context in which we live. However, that does not invite us to hate them because they hate us. The more of them and us we think, the more antagonistic that we will be because the reality is, is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all stand in need of him. So instead of an us and them that puts us in a place of superiority and them in a place of, of, of inferiority, the fact that, that Jesus loves us and demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and that God in his mercy sent someone to tell us the gospel and he drew us to him and enabled us to proclaim faith in him and he made us alive together with Christ, all of those things should not create in us a position of arrogance and superiority, but ridiculous thanksgiving that God has been so kind to redeem us. And it ought to compel us to go with love and compassion to a world that actively hates us with the good news of Jesus because they don't just hate us, they hate him. And so if we see the world as the enemy, we will never reach them with the gospel because honestly, we won't care. Because if the world is the enemy, then who cares what happens to them? And we might not say it in an articulation, but it might be our attitude of if the world hates us and I hate them and I view them as the enemy, let them go to hell because I don't care. But if we follow him who demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that God demonstrated his own love for them, that while they were still sinners, Christ died for them, and that we would let him move us with compassion to the people that hate us because they not just hate us, but they hate him, and they desperately need to hear the gospel. That changes our attitude. Because we can't rightly be following him and hate the world. demands us to engage the world with the gospel. Because if you were of the world, the world would love its own, but you're not of the world. I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But we're still called to go to that world with the gospel. In verse 20, he says, Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Don't be surprised when the world hates you. Why, why would they hate me and love you? Why would they hate me and love you? 
Well, wouldn't it be, can we just be honest? Wouldn't it be easier if that were the case? Can't I just love Jesus and them still like me? I mean, don't we, don't we want to be liked? Anybody else like to be liked? I don't like to be liked. I love to be liked. But Jesus says it's a natural engaging that don't be surprised when they hate you because they hated me first. Verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. Verse 21 is kind of the, the, the hinge pin of this text. They, they act this way, they engage this way because they don't know the one who sent me. But if I had not come and spoke to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done uh, among them the works which no one, no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. So we see this, this challenge from the Lord, not merely just looking at the world, but the Lord challenges this, this reality for us to where we might ask ourselves the question, how is the world treating us? This, this, is, this is a particularly messy part of this text. Because I'm not inviting us to go out and look for conflict. I'm not inviting us to be, to be rude and, and unlikable. Because I want us to understand what Jesus is saying here. The world will not like you because of my namesake. Following Jesus will put us in conflict with the direction that the world's going. It does not invite us to be jerks. It does not invite us to be rude. It does not invite us to be unkind. It does not invite us to engage in name calling and slander and mud throwing. If we're unlikable because we're being unlikable, that makes sense. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about that they won't like you, they'll hate you because of my namesake. So don't, don't think for a moment that this is inviting us to behave in a way that is unlikable. And if the world is actively working against you, that you can play it off on Scripture and say, well, the world's just going to not like me. It's like, well, maybe you're acting unlikable. But as we follow Jesus, it will put us at odds with the world. And so how is the world treating us? If the world's treating us in a hateful manner because we're following Jesus, that ought to be expected. But we can also ask the question, how is the world hearing us? As we follow Jesus, are the words that we're proclaiming and the life that we're living in concert with one another? Because Jesus tells his disciples that the world will know that you are my, my disciples by, and, and we want to start filling in the blank right there either by the church that you attend or the denomination of which you're a part or the political affiliation which you claim loyalty to. or the oh, No, he says, the way that the world will know that you're my disciples is the way that you love one another. The way that you tweet is not engaged in that. We ought to be honoring to the Lord in the way that we engage social media, but we ought to be honoring to the Lord in the way that we engage everybody in the way that the world will know that we're followers of Jesus is the way that we love each other. So we see this context that the world hates those who follow Jesus. And we see the responsibility that it gives us is the way that we engage with one another, the way that we engage the world, and the way that we carry the responsibility to take the gospel to people who don't like us. And that can be discouraging at the least. And at the worst, make us want to quit. But in the end of this chapter, Jesus gives some encouragement to those who will follow him, or those who are following him. He gives the counsel from the Lord that we have here. Of where can we find strength? 
In verse 25, Jesus says, But they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled, that it is written in their law, they hated me without cause. I would encourage you as we read through these texts and work through these texts uh, leading up to Easter, look for the places where Jesus says that something was done or said so that the things that were written about the Messiah would be fulfilled. Because even and up to Jesus dying on the cross, he is still fulfilling messianic prophecy. And so he encourages the disciples to receive strength from the Scripture. He's saying, this shouldn't surprise you all because you see it happening with me, but at the same time, this was promised beforehand. And he gives the disciples a model of remembering that, that they can come to the understanding of the Scripture to receive encouragement as they engage this world that hates them. He says, look to the Scripture, it's being fulfilled. The same can be true for us as believers in modern day as we engage these, these realities of the world that is set against the one that we have given our lives to, that we find strength in the truth of the Scripture. That's why it's vital for us to be good students of the Word. That regardless of where we are in our walk with Christ, whether we're just beginning it or whether we've known Jesus for a long time, we never, ever, and catch this, we never, ever outgrow the need for regular engagement with the Scripture. Never. If you're a new follower of Jesus, the Bible is not beyond you. That You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus says that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. And so as you are a, a student of the Word, as you learn to read the Word and study the Word, uh, it's, it's encouraging to find people with whom you can study. That's why we have things like small groups and, and Sunday school classes and, and, and D groups and, and those kind of things. It's not so that we can just fill up our church calendar, but it's so that we can have smaller groups of people with whom we can engage in real life and study of the Scripture. So we can take this incredibly large book made up of smaller books written over a couple thousand years so we can take this and, and begin to, to learn how to engage it and how to study it and how to read it and, and we can do so in concert and in community with other people so if you're a new follower of Jesus the Bible is not beyond you and if you've known Jesus for a long time the Bible is not something that you know everything the most tragic thing I've ever heard in my life is I heard a preacher once many years ago say, I've preached through the Bible twice. What else is there to learn? And everything in me thought, well, man, I'm glad you did it twice. Because if you had just done it once, imagine what you would have missed. But I thought, what a heartbreaking thing to think that you've gone through it twice. Therefore, you've, you've understood everything that's there. I thought you should teach classes or something. So if you've known Jesus a little time, the Bible's not beyond you. If you've known Jesus a long time, you are still really dependent on this. And we need to engage in the Word to be strengthened from the Scripture. But not also, or only from the Scripture, but also by the indwelling of the Spirit. Jesus talks about that in verse 26. He says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. So the Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus, and Jesus says that the, the Holy Spirit is the, the helper or the counselor, the one who comes alongside. The word there is paraclete. As Jesus ascends to heaven, he sends the Spirit to come and to be here with us, to live in us, to empower us, to bring fruit in our lives, to the fruit of the Spirit, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, to quicken us, to teach us, to be our teacher in the Word, to understand and to empower us to engage the world with the gospel. We are desperately dependent upon the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because apart from Him, we can do nothing. So we receive strength from the Scripture. We receive strength from the Spirit. But at the same time, we also receive strength from the saints. We are called and created to live in community with one another. And verse 27, you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus talks about the disciples, the apostles, bearing witness of him because they've been with him. But he's also calling them to do so in community with one another. And the, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we've got this thing called the book of Acts, which is how this model is given and exploded throughout the first century world. There's a reason you're here this morning. It's because we're wired for this. But if all you do, if all we do is come to a worship gathering 
on Sunday morning and we don't engage relationally with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and we aren't living life with some people, then we are missing, uh, hear this, we are missing the majority of what church is for. In southern vernacular, we have horribly misused a word and I would like for us to not use it anymore. Because in the South, if you hear somebody say, well, what are you going to do Sunday morning? I guess I'll go to church. What they have said is, I will go to a a gathering. Because that's the word. The the church is a a Greek word that means gathering or assembling. But it's describing this body of believers that doesn't just assemble one time a week, but we gather. When you say that in, in the South, you say, well, I'm going to church. What they mean is I'm going to a worship service on Sunday morning at a particular building. But the word church is talking about people. It's not a building. It's not an event. The church gathers at this time, at this place, this part of the body of believers so that we can worship together and hear the word together and pray together and be together. But we also gather in smaller groups all throughout the week. There were some groups that met before this service in what we call Sunday school. There are some groups that are going to meet this evening. There are some groups that are going to meet through the week to live life together, to pray together, to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. So what I would rather us say is, what are we going to do on Sunday morning? I'm going to go worship with my church family. To say what we're going to do and with whom we are going to do that thing. I'm going to worship with my church family. I'm going to go study the Bible with a smaller group of my church family. Because I promise, you say that in the South, and the change in lingo will call somebody's attention. They'll say, what do you mean by that? You know what you just did? You just invited me into potential for a gospel conversation. Because if you say, I'm going to go to church, they automatically assume they know what you mean. Are we playing word games? No, but words matter. Words mean something. Because they might not know what worship really is. They might have experienced the service at some point, but they may not really understand why we come to this place and do what we do. It's not so that we can be moral or be better. It's not it. We do carry the responsibility to live lives that reflect Him. But honestly, you can get people to be moral by any manner of encouragement, motivation. If it were simply about being moral, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. Because you can find some people in the Gospels that were very moral, that rejected Jesus. It's not about morality. Because honestly, the world doesn't hate moral people. The world acknowledges moral people kind of likes them. But we are called to be infinitely more than just moral. We are called to lay down our lives and follow Him. And when we do so, it will put us at odds in the context where we live. But they did that to Jesus. So why would we expect anything less? I want to invite us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. And this morning we're going to have a time to respond to what God is is doing in this moment, to respond publicly. But the reality for a, a text like this is that the majority of our responding to Jesus and what he's doing in this moment is going to be when we leave this place because We come here, and and we don't expect to be hated. We come here, we expect to be loved and affirmed and encouraged, and, and so we should. But we need that encouragement because when we leave here, we're going into a culture that that detests the one to whom we claim 
to follow as Lord. So maybe this morning you just needed a reminder of where you find strength to engage that culture, that it's not in your own character, it's not in your own will, it's not in your own determination, but that we can receive encouragement through the, the Scripture, through the Spirit, and in the fellowship of believers. And maybe you've been participating or attending just out of habit and you maybe needed a reminder this morning of why we do what we do. So maybe the way that you respond this morning is that from the outside it doesn't look much different, but maybe your, your heart and your mind and your thought about why you do what you do might be refreshed. Or maybe this morning you, you realized that you've had a very adversarial approach to the world. And maybe your heart's been a little hardened and, and jaded towards the world because it, it doesn't like us. And maybe you've lost that compassion for the lostness of the world. And, and this morning God's been renewing your, your sensitivity, your tenderness to the lostness of the world. And and he, he might be encouraging you this morning to be more attuned and more active in, in looking for the opportunity for gospel conversations. All those expressions will happen after this morning. We're thankful for those. But this morning, we're going to sing a song together to give you an opportunity. If God is, is calling you right now to respond publicly in some way, we want to give you opportunity to do that. Primarily in one of three ways. This morning, if you do not know Jesus... And you came this morning, and as Zach said earlier in the service, if you're just exploring, and this morning you have felt drawn to come and repent of your sin, to ask Jesus to forgive you and to, to proclaim lordship, uh, to, to, to proclaim loyalty to Jesus as Lord, and you want to become a follower of Jesus, become one of his disciples this morning, we would love to speak with you. So when we stand and sing in just a moment, if I just described you and you want to come to know Jesus this morning, I want to invite you to come while we're singing. And there will be some folks here at the front that would love to speak more to you, to hear you, to hear your heart, and to maybe share some scripture with you to help you make sure that you understand what you're doing and so that we can help you in that beginning of a relationship with Jesus. If you already know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you've never followed him in believer's baptism, maybe this morning you want to commit to do that, to submit yourself to do that. Well, when we stand and sing, and while we're singing, if you'll come and tell one of the people at the front, I know Jesus, but I need to be baptized, we would love to celebrate that with you. Or if you have questions about what it means to be a member of Stuart Heights Baptist Church, or if you're ready to make that commitment, if you've been talking with us and and you're ready to make that commitment, we would love nothing more than to be able to share with you this morning. So, Father, I pray that in this moment that you'll be pleased